We all remember the words from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs by the Wicked Queen. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? The mirror could never lie, and thus began our personal infatuation for critiquing ourselves and comparing ourselves to others. Today we're talking about the self-sabotaging talk we all have used to wish away our thick, thin, curly, straight, limp, gray, blonde, brown hair. <laughs> as well as maybe our fat, thin, tall, short, big bones, skeleton, or gaunt features. Our desire to make sure our features are perfect before others take a look and judge has always been at the forefront. We also know about looking in the mirror and determining our self-worth by the reflection that stares back, that meets or doesn't meet our own expectations. We try to stop the negative self-talk, but we can't help ourselves. For thousands of years, the mirror's been a reflection of image, power, and status. And from these reflections of ourselves come our ideas about food, dieting, thinking our diet is the reason for all our problems, and how did we become so critical and so self-indulgent in looking past health, happiness, and joy in our efforts to look and think ourselves perfect. Our guest today, Bonnie Giller, is a registered and certified dietitian nutritionist, certified diabetes care, and an education specialist and certified intuitive eating counselor. She has her master's of science degree with clinical nutrition and has worked in medical nutrition therapy and counseling for over 35 years. Bonnie helps chronic dieters develop trust with themselves and food so they can break free of dieting and live life to the fullest. Using her signature intuitive eating program called Whole Body Trust, Intuitive Eating for a Peaceful Life, Bonnie helps her clients support and honor their minds and body. She works with adults and teens, guiding them in changing their relationships with food and their body. And the result is they make peace with food, enjoy guilt-free eating, and live a healthy life they love. You're listening to Be Well with Michelle Greenwell. This is sponsored by Dance Debut Inc. and the Cape Breton Tea Company. And I'm very pleased to welcome Bonnie Giller. Hello, Bonnie. Thank you for being Hello, here. Hello, Michelle. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. So before we begin the conversation, I always like to set the intention for our listeners. So this uh, is, I always pull a card from my affirmations for the body and biofield deck. You can find it on dancedebut.com in the shop if it's something that is drawing to you. And what I did, I, I always, I cut the deck wherever it cuts, knowing what our topic's going to be. And I chuckled again. Every, every time I do this, I chuckle. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to hold up the card so you can see. So for those people who are on the podcast, the card, it's ribbons of color. And so there's white kind of woven through all of it. But there's ribbons of green and yellow that almost look like butterfly wings. And then there's red and other shades of green and purple and pink and blue. It's a beautiful rainbow of color. And the affirmation that goes with this is our intuition guides us. There is a gentle wisdom in the subtle energies that surround us. Communications flow easily and peacefully. There's no need to hurry. All happens in perfect and divine timing. And it relates to the upper dantian, which in Tai Chi is at the base of the uh, back of the brain. And that's that last connection of energy as it comes up the spine through the body to the back of the head and to clear and open thoughts. So I thought that was pretty uh, telling kind of of where we were going to head today. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Interesting how that happens, doesn't it? I love it. I love yeah. it. So my intention with the podcast is to provide you, the listener, with a healing opportunity while you're listening. So if you've set your intention of why you're listening today, we've set our intention of why we're here. And together, we're going to create a course that allows us to maybe change some habits or some thought patterns as we go along. So to finish this, we always offer a tea because that's a great way to transform energy. And Bonnie today didn't pack tea, but she's got her favorite mug and she's going to tell us what she's put inside. Mm, okay. 
So should I show my mug? Absolutely. <laughs> my mug, I don't know if you can see, it says most awesome mom. And then in the back, it says in the entire history of the world ever. <laughs> so this is my favorite mug because my daughters gave it to me. I have uh, four children, two boys, boy, boy, girl, girl. Um, and uh, it must have been for like a Mother's Day gift or or I think it was. And um, family means everything to me, like my family, my kids, my grandchildren, you know, my, everybody. They just mean the world to me. So I really enjoy drinking, whether it's my tea in the evening or my coffee by day in my mug. And it just means a lot to me. So that's what I have here today. I, I think I'm jealous. I don't have a mug that says anything about oh. being a mom or grandma on it. <laughs> <laughs> We might have to make sure you get one. I don't. I think so. <laughs> uh, when when my son is reviewing this podcast to do the uh -huh. technical aspects, maybe he'll pick that up. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and what did you put inside your mug today? So today I put a coffee inside my mug. I generally drink my lavender tea in the evening. Actually, every evening, religiously. Uh, lavender is very relaxing, and my days tend to be very go 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 go. And um, I really enjoy my cup of lavender tea um, every evening before I go to bed. Uh, so much so that when, when I'm talking to my mom and I was like, and I'm like, okay, mom, have a good night. She goes, okay, go have your tea. Like it's just a known thing. <laughs> so, um, and then by day, I generally enjoy my coffee. And um, today, especially, has been a pretty hectic day. Um, and so I put my favorite butter toffee flavored coffee. It's very soothing, and I just love the aroma of it. And so that's what I have here with me today to speak with you. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Delicious. Oh, I love it. I love it. There's so much that people can do just with a cup of their favorite whatever. And I have a lot of people too, when they show me their mug, they hug it, which oh. just tells you how much we get out of the mug when we take the time. Um, I didn't choose a mug today. Um, I chose a clear glass because I just wanted to show the color of the tea um, today, oh. just because it's just so beautiful. Um, this one is one of my favorite blends, and I created it with my daughter and a girlfriend, and it's called Apple Passion. So it has apple, cinnamon, cloves. It's like uh, muffins or pumpkin, or pumpkin, apple pie, that kind of an idea that comes with it, but it has the comfort and feeling of home. So when I go to open the package, that's the first thing is you were talking about the smell of your coffee. And it's the mm -hmm. same. I, when I open the package to make the tea and I smell the cinnamon and the cloves, it just stops me and I just feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. I always try to pull that idea forward. And then, as I was saying today, I used to go just to the mugs and the dark colored mugs, but I've started to respond more to the colors of the tea. And so I've enjoyed putting it into a clear glass where I can see it. And it's almost like drinking from a wine glass, which makes it kind of fancy. It um, does look pretty fancy, but, actually. Yeah. 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 So cheers. And thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. And thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> I'm going to choke. <laughs> Drank too uh, quickly to cheers with you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, that's right. And we'll take our while care. you're trying to talk, Bonnie. <clears throat> Message for everybody. Okay. That's anyway. right. That's right. Take your time. Take the sip. Um, okay. So, Bonnie, let's let's start into. I always like to talk about the transformation that um, we as coaches or uh, wellness supporters go through because we've all been there in some capacity Absolutely. so do you want to tell us a little bit about your story about what had you change your ideas about food and the way you look at things and how you've moved forward from it absolutely I really would as I finish choking <clears throat> I would love to share my story um and I thank you for asking so for myself, uh, so uh, as an intro, you did introduce me as a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and so how I even got into nutrition and how my life was impacted by it. So growing up, <clears throat> I had seen my mom diet. She pretty much, once she had children, uh, and we are three, so I'm one of three. So once she had all the children, 
she started going on the diets. Now she usually she pretty much chose one diet, but it was on and off, on and off, on and off, right? Over and over again. And it was something that I I watched. Um growing up as I got a little bit older and I was a teenager, at that point, I was like, you know, maybe I want to lose a couple of pounds. And I remember going to study abroad after high school, um, before, like my gap year between high school and college. <clears throat> and one of the things I said to myself, I will not come back having gained weight. I said that to myself because all the girls, I had gone to a girl's high school, all the girls older than me that had gone away for gap year had come home inevitably with weight gain. And back in the day, when you were allowed to meet people at the gate, right up at the, near, almost near the plane, you know, I remember when I would go to the airport if friends were coming home or my brothers who had gone in before me, you know, and I always hear people whisper when the people would be coming off the plane, they'd be, oh, look how much weight she gained. Oh, look how much, terrible, terrible. It made such an impression on me. I said, well, when it's my turn to go, I am not going to gain weight. So I went for the year and I watched, I use air quotes, we'll talk about that, but I watched myself really very strictly and I exercised and it was really where I actually lost quite a bit of weight. I didn't really have to lose weight, so let me just add that, but I was so panicked that I would gain weight that I really restricted, lost weight when I came off the plane. Nobody said, wow, look how much weight she gained, like, wow, look, look how much weight she lost. My parents were very concerned. They were like, oh my God, we've got to take you to a doctor. And I said, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I went to college. I started. And then, you know, eventually I chose my major of nutrition, which by the way, is an interesting story in and of itself. Again, back in the day, you may remember, how did you register for classes? There was this huge book of classes. There was no computer registration, right? And we stood on long registration lines. We had to look up classes in a, in a book. I had one, this must have been my third semester in college, and I had a slot open in my schedule. And I was like, I don't know what class to put. I said, I'm just going to open the book. I'm going to go like this, close my eyes, wherever my finger lands, if it's the right time, I'm taking that class. And lo and behold, it was a class in the nutrition department. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to take it. Anyway, I loved it. Long story short, I majored in nutrition, and <clears throat> my eating habits normalized in other words I regained some weight when I was back home in a comfortable environment nurturing environment and I was really fine I was great and then I started dating and then it was the pressure of dating and then my friends were doing these different fad diets and I was like okay let me do this and let me try that all in an effort to lose let's say five or ten pounds I guess you know the truth is when you think back it's all the seeds that are planted. Now, my mother is well-meaning, didn't mean any harm, but her dieting planted a seed. In my mind, I'm gathering now that I know more that mom is not happy with her body. And okay. And eventually I was like, let me, let me do this dieting thing. So Fast forward, I got married. I had my first child. I was got my man. I went on to get my master's, and then I went to work in a weight loss center. Um, and I left that job within three weeks because I realized I was like a warden to these people. <laughs> I had to tell them what to do, what not to do, how to eat, how not to eat. And then I was actually instructed by my supervisor to yell at somebody if they quote unquote cheated. And I was like, whoa, I didn't go to school to get my nutrition degree to, to, to do this to people. It was horrible, right? I left that job and I opened my own private practice. Now, what was interesting throughout the years is I was eating in a way that I was teaching my clients, well-balanced and all. I had, I had again, four children with each pregnancy. I gained the weight. I went on a diet, which was healthy, well-balanced to lose the weight. And then after my fourth child was born, so something occurred. For the first time in all my pregnancies, I had postpartum blues, they called it. It wasn't postpartum depression, it was postpartum blues. But for whatever you want to call it, I cried like dropping my hat out of a hat, right? And 
that first year after she was born, I actually put weight on. So instead of losing the baby weight, right? I did not, I not only didn't lose what I gained, but I now put more weight on over the course of that year. And I remember going to my physician and I was, and I was working at the time. And, um, you know, I, I said, I was crying to him and I was like, I just don't feel good in my body. And I don't know what's going on. And he says, you know what you need to do? you know, which is always the worst thing to say, you know, and I was like, okay, I, and he goes, you need to exercise. I said, I'm, I, and I was always an exerciser so that you want to know. Right. And so I said to him, you're a man, you just don't understand. <laughs> and I left his office driving home crying. And I'm like, look, I have a husband. I have a family, a home to take care of. I have four children. I have students because I was also not only running my own private practice, but I was a an internship director teaching other students to become RDs. I had a lot on my plate, but that's when I said, no, Bonnie, you know what to do. So get yourself on a meal plan like you do for your clients and just, you can do this. And I did. I did. I, I got back into shape. I lost the weight. I felt great. My health was fantastic. And then it occurred to me, I think I'm dieting. And I'm like, am I dieting? No, I'm not on any diet. I'm just eating well. But that's how sneaky the diet mentality is. And I noticed it in my clients, which is when I realized that I am doing this sneaky dieting that is disguised as just eating healthy. Why do I say that? My kids would give us an anniversary cake. My kids would give me a birthday cake or anything. And I would always be like, should I? Shouldn't I? Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I have that piece or not? Right? This is part of this diet mentality. And that coincided with when I saw this in my clients who were calling me back, Bonnie, I need a new meal plan. And I was like, why? I just need a new meal plan. I regained the weight. And then the yo-yoing. And that's when I researched and I had always heard of the anti-diet movement. So you must have heard of that, right? Mm-hmm. But I couldn't wrap my head around how do I work with clients without giving them a meal plan. Like, how do you even do that? Because I went to school in a very weight centric model back in the day. That's what we were taught. Mm -hmm. You have diabetes, you have heart disease, or you're just carrying excess weight, you know? Follow the food groups, follow the exchange list, count, weigh and measure, lose weight. That's the solution to everything. That's what I learned and um, only to realize that that's false. Mm -hmm. And I studied under, there are two creators of intuitive eating, two RDs from California. And I studied under one of them. I had supervision. I took an exam. I became certified. And then I decided to apply it to my life. And you asked me, maybe you'll ask me, but so I'll say it. What was the defining moment for me to finally say, Bonnie, you really are dieting, even though you're eating healthy, you're following this meal plan. I never demonized food ever. And to me, I was just eating healthy. Well, one night um, I had not, I, I used, let me say it this way. I wrote down everything I used to eat, every morsel of food and beverage. And I wrote the calories and I would track my calories. And here it was one evening, I was running late for something and I hadn't written anything down. And I turned around to my daughter, maybe she was like 10 or 12, maybe, no, maybe 12 or 13 at the time. And I said, Jen, hurry up, grab my little red notebook and write down everything I'm going to tell you and these calories and add it up. So I know how much to eat tonight. And right then I turned around I looked her straight in the eyes and I'm like, oh my God, what did I just do? And then I said, don't do that. <laughs> I said, don't do that. Never mind. And I was realized like, what am I teaching my daughter? My other daughter was really too young to be exposed to that. She wasn't around. She's like, what am I doing to her? What message am I giving? And it was at that moment that I made this, the decision. I will not track anything ever again. I will incorporate what I'm learning around intuitive eating into my life. And only then will I bring it to my clients. And that's what I did. And it was amazingly freeing to be able to lift all those restrictions, to be able to identify the diet mentality in its sneaky form, to really be able to have freedom and making decisions. And I'm just so grateful that I've been able to transition in my own personal life. And then it moved its way into transforming how I practice with my clients and my patients in all areas. So 
I'll kind of stop there in case you have any questions. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just like, wow. <laughs> because how many of us, and, and still, you know, it's generations have that mentality. And it's the same with exercise. How much time have you been exercising for? How many steps have you taken? How much, um, how much of certain kinds of activities have you done? When you go to the gym, you lift the weights, you count everything. What a difference to let it go and go, how do I feel? And how does it make me feel? Oh my gosh, it's all about tuning in. It's all about tuning in. And not just tuning in and listening to the messages of your body, but then it's learning to trust those messages because that's the whole the whole thing, right? People don't trust themselves with food, with exercise, with making their own decisions. And everybody has that wisdom within. And so I worked through that process for myself to listen, to trust. And it's just, it's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you stand in front of the mirror... Do you say, man, I love the person that I am? Is that kind of what happens now in front of the mirror? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Listen, I think everybody has certain days, myself included, where a couple of, we'll call them bad body image moments hit. It all, it happens, right? Um, But really the goal is to focus on you as an individual, your characteristics, your attributes, and really, your, my message and, and is my message to myself, but also to others is your worth is not determined by a number on a scale or a size of your clothes. And unfortunately, that is not the message that's out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're right. How many? I, I, I'm fascinated even with um, when people are happy and joyful. Out of their mouth does not come what you said, seeing people come in from the airport, how much weight they've put on, or they get out of the car and it used to be, you know, what color is your hair? Oh, you've got more gray hair in it. (laughs) All those, those judgmental kinds of comments. But when you feel really good about who you are, all those judgmental things just fall away. They're not necessary. That's right. Yeah. Right. It just takes time for people who have been sucked into the diet culture, it does take time to really climb your way out of it, but it is possible to get there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so now I'm curious too then about your kids, because you have two boys and two girls. So I know that's a completely different viewpoints. Um, and also even the way they would be raised, yes, by you as a family, but also by the culture that they live in. What have you noticed about your kids? I mean, my boys really have been oblivious to diets and stuff like that. So they're, you know, there's no issue at all. I would say my girls more so influenced. Um, I mean, I I, I don't want to say that, you know, disordered eating and eating disorders doesn't hit the male. You know, it does. Um, but but thankfully, it, it wasn't a thing with my sons. As far as my daughters go, so the one daughter that I mentioned about, you know, oh, go write, write down everything in my notebook. So she had a little bit of a challenging time when she was dating. She's now married and everything is great. But she did because of the judgment of what others would think of her, the boys and things like that. Um, and so she's, um, you know, so she went through a little difficult stage there around body image, but thankfully has gotten to the other side. And my other daughter, who's only just beginning to perhaps start dating, um, she really is, it's really interesting. And, and, and as you bring this question up, I'm realizing my, my first daughter was more exposed to me when I was disguised dieting, right? Like I was dieting, but I didn't know I was dieting because I was just eating healthy, aka dieting. Um, she was exposed to that, whereas my younger daughter was not. My younger daughter was more exposed to me talking about intuitive eating all the time because I I, te- I teach it, I live it, I breathe it. I just can't help myself, right? When I talk <laughs> about it because I love it so much. And um, so she, she's really cute because, you know, she'll be sitting at the table and she says, I'm intuitive. I'm eating intuitively. I'm I'm full now. I'm gonna stop. You know, it's like as a younger kid, she would say this. 
Um, and so it was so cute. And then, and now that she's a little bit older, she would always tell me like when she was in high school, stories of her friends who would be going on these crazy diets. And she says, but I would tell them diets don't work. And she would like almost repeat things that I would say because she really soaked it up. And I'm so grateful because she has a great relationship with food and her body now. So mm-hmm. it's so very interesting as I'm speaking it through with you, right? My first daughter, my boys, forget about whatever, but my first daughter, who's my third child, she was definitely exposed to a lot more of that dieting talk from me. And, and, and she had a little tricky period of transition, but not, not my younger daughter when I really is all about intuitive eating and trusting your body and no food is good, bad, on or off. Well, we really set our kids up to when they're little, you need to eat more. You haven't had enough. Sit down and eat. Um, you know, it's time to sit at the table while everybody's eating. You need to finish. And, and we have this constant dialogue around that. Instead of saying, you know, they say, I'm not hungry. And we say, it's time to eat. <laughs> you know what? You're so right. And everybody is born with this ability called intuitive eating. It's innate. Eat, you know, knowing when you're hungry, knowing when you're full. Um, and I always say to people, if your baby is pushing away, brass bottle, spoon, and you are insisting one more bite, just a little bit more, what message are you sending to that child or baby? Oh, I can't trust my own signals. Mm-hmm. I feel one thing, but mom is telling me something different. And I mean, when you're younger, you trust your mom, your caretaker. Mm-hmm. So it's it's how you so it's how even with well-meaning parents at a young age you can move away from that inner wisdom as your guide. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow, I, I'm hoping that as people are listening to this and, and realizing um, the family traits that came down and the cultural opportunities that we've had um, to realize some of those ghosts that are walking around in their head that will be able to um, let go. And again, that takes us back to that card that we pulled at the very beginning in that the intuition is there, the capability is there, everything we need, we have. So when you know that, it's not that you're not enough anymore. You are enough. Then it's okay to now make new decisions, different decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's trusting. That's why it's all about trust. It's trusting your own thoughts. It's your beliefs. It's what actions you take. It's trusting your body. It's trusting that you know the choices that feel good for you. You don't need anybody else telling you what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat. You do know that. It's mm-hmm. really getting back to listening, he- hearing it, and then saying, yeah, I got you. I trust you. Mm-hmm. Yourself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that inner talk, that self-talk. Exactly. Yeah. So now you work with uh, teenagers and adults. So yeah. when a teenager comes to you, what kind of approach do you typically use? So, you know, I, I work, uh, let me say this way, I work right now more with adults, but I do work with teens Um, so it's really a very similar approach to the way I work with adults. However, when adults come to me with a history of dieting of not just years, but decades, it's so very important to begin to unlearn the damaging messages of diet culture. So we very much begin with working on rejecting the diet mentality and ultimately, or I should say, eventually we get to learning about nourishing your body. At that point, you've shifted your mindset. You're hearing it. Every conversation around nutrition, you're now hearing from an intuitive eater's ear, not from a dieter's ear. Because if you've been dieting for years and decades, any conversation I have about protein, fat, carbs, your hearing is more rules. So we've got to really flesh out and get rid of all the rules before we can have that conversation with about nutrition. With teens, I do find it to be a little different. A lot of them don't have that knowledge around nutrition. They're dieting perhaps, but not for as long. And I can help them understand how their body works and how to nourish themselves in a way that feels good 
in the beginning of our work. And then we move into understanding about intuitive eating, understanding about the, the signals and your wisdom and connecting back to that. So it's a little bit flipped, but as per usual, I always assess it on an individual basis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and you were talking about uh, having people well, I think we brought it up a couple times, so let's let me put it this way. <laughs> so, food is always a fixer, right? So, so when you have uh, something good happen, then you choose a food to celebrate with, and then when something doesn't go well, you choose that food <laughs> that's supposed to make you feel better, and then it usually doesn't. It just makes you feel guilty. Um, so, as people are weaving through those celebratory kinds of things or those mm, supportive kind of gestures. How do you usually approach that? What kinds of things do you talk about then? So what you're, you're, what you're speaking of is under the umbrella of emotional eating. You're eating due to certain emotions. There are various emotions. They could be sad, you know, emotions, but it can also be happy emotions. So I do not demonize emotional eating as the way many people do, and I'll explain why. We as humans have emotions. That's just, you know, we're made up with emotions. Nothing wrong, no good or bad around emotions. And sometimes if somebody has a healthy relationship with food, and in this moment they make a choice to choose to eat if they're feeling sad and they need to soothe, if there's other tools in their toolbox to manage emotions, then eating if in done in a very mindful and aware way, maybe just part of their toolbox. The problem comes in when a person's number one thought immediately goes to food. They use food to cope with all sorts of emotions. And that is the only way they, they manage emotions is with food, oftentimes sedating themselves, numbing out, right? This is where the damaging behavior comes in and can become a very big problem and very destructive. And so in those cases, we recognize that, and then we learn how to cope with emotions, with kindness, with self-compassion, and not with food. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's such a lovely way to look at it, um, because I think we, oh, we've just been trained, right? You, you come home from school, you go in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. The conversations yeah. all start in the kitchen. Right. <laughs> and, and, and for a lot of people, that's like transition eating, you know, mm-hmm. from transitioning from one event or task to another, there's always food in between. That's mm-hmm. it. That's transition eating or a conditioned eating behavior. You've just taught yourself, you've conditioned yourself to eat in these moments, in these times. When you pick up a book to read, you're always eating. So this is a conditioned eating behavior. It doesn't mean that on an occasion, if you're reading and you want to munch on something, there's anything wrong with it. But if every single time you pick up a book, you have to have a snack, that's when we want to look at that a little closer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then that takes us to the people that eat in front of the TV set. Distraction. Absolutely. Watching their show or, or listening to a podcast because they, they plug themselves in and they lose track of time. You don't know 45 minutes has gone by how much food has been consumed and you didn't even really realize. And and even beyond the quantity, there's a lack of appreciation because savoring your food and engaging with your food, the taste, the, the texture, the aroma, all of that is so important to give you satisfaction and pleasure and attunement, which is back to the how much. When we eat without distraction, we are better able to attune to a comfortable fullness state to know, oh, I'm done. And I paid so much attention and I really enjoyed it. It hit all the senses and I'm satiated. So both physically satisfied and psychologically satisfied because someone might become physically satisfied and full, but psychologically they're not because they weren't engaging with it. And now they're looking for food. They're on the prowl after the meal. Like I just need a little something. And that's mm-hmm. because they're missing that psychological satisfaction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's, uh, it's been a theme actually across the different podcasts as I've talked to 
people on many different topics, but all the topics come back to the five senses mm. and how much we're using those five senses. And I'll say it that way because yes, we hear things. Yes, we see things. Those are the two common, <laughs> but the smelling and the tasting sometimes get left behind or they're numbed. If they're numbed by a food that uh, you're sensitive to, you might actually not taste or smell them. Um, and to be able to bring that back in, uh, in all the conversations, when we've got those five senses really feeding us, it's a different way of living. Absolutely. Absolutely. And makes such a difference in the realm of food and eating mm -hmm. and eating without guilt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then that's where that time spent in the kitchen too, preparing something is the those senses are all brought alive by the cooking procedure. Intuitive cooking. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 The exactly. Sizzle, the smell, the aroma, all of it increases your satisfaction of your meal. And then what usually happens too, is that all of you have to do is put onions into the pan. <laughs> and then you've got the rest of the family showing up because right. oh, that smells really good. What are you doing? Right. Conversation has exactly. started pretty soon. There's gathering in the kitchen. Yeah. That's that's the community part of of food, of bringing people Absolutely. together. Absolutely, yep. yeah, Absolutely, yeah. that doesn't come out of a a box with a package, right? That you've ripped open. <laughs> Nobody um, cares about that food, <laughs> right? Totally, totally. Yeah, it's a beautiful experience. <laughs> oh, so you have an offer on your website. Do you want to share a little bit about what's there? Sure, sure. So I do have a, an ebook download that everybody can get for free, Six Steps to a Body You Love Without Dieting. And, you know, I work with people who are recovering from dieting, or at least who want to stop dieting, right? And so the ebook takes you through six key steps. And it's part of the process of my signature program, as you mentioned, Whole Body Trust. Um, uh, so yeah, and there's, it's a, there's, it, it's, it's reading, but it's also a workbook aspect. So there's lots of questions. So you can give thought, you can journal, uh, and it really helps you to really ad identify, am I a dieter? Do I have all these rules that are really disconnecting me from my intuition? And what do I need to do to kind of get back in touch? And do you want to say the website's name? Yes, thank you. It's dietfreeradiantme.com. So if you just listen to that, it's like diet free, radiant me, you're radiant when you stop dieting. It's such a beautiful feeling and you glow on the outside because living life on a diet is not happy. <laughs> it is not a happy life and it causes more stress and dieting actually causes weight gain. So, you know, it's so interesting. So, so thus the name of my website, dietfreeradiantme.com. Perfect. And you also offer online and in person. And I know we've all shifted over the pandemic. So do you want to talk a little bit about what you've noticed about being able to help people online? Absolutely. So I do have an on an, an offline practice, which thank you to the pandemic is actually now all virtual. So more of the people in my local community or referrals from local doctors who reach out for more medical nutrition therapy work, I do meet them online. Um, and then the online, official online work I do is all around intuitive eating. And what I've noticed is, so first of all, when I was seeing patients and clients in office and now they're online, they love it. They love it. There's, it's so flexible. It takes away that barrier of, oh, I got traffic to get to your office, right? We can have appointments at any time. And it, it, it's just really wonderful and flexible and I'm loving it. And as far as working online with my intuitive eating, I love this as an opportunity because I, I can touch people in all parts of the world. And for me to send the message that I'm so passionate about that, you know, I mean, men and women, I do work with men as well, but I would say more so women um, with my online group program is, is for women only, just the message that you can trust yourself with food. You can, eating can be easy 
enjoyable and nourishing to your body and your mind. And it's a, it's my passion because I see how much damage has been done, not just to myself in the earlier years, but to my clients, to women who reach out to me, physical damage, mental health damage. And I just want to help free them from that and mm-hmm. really truly live their best life. Because, you know, when I always ask my clients, like, how much of your brain space is <laughs> taken up with worries around food? How much of your day is spent bashing your own body, wishing for a different body, worrying about what you're going to put in your body? Well, guess what? When you release all of that, how much time will you now have to tend to other things that are of interest in your life? I have had clients who've created businesses, who have new relationships, who's gone on vacations. That It's just their life has opened up without all of, all of this worry. And it doesn't mean nutrition is not important. Nutrition is key to living a healthy, optimal life. But we're doing it now without all that mindset of restrictions and good, bad, and worth is not tied to a number. And it's just so very different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you talked about uh, your group opportunity. Yes. And what I've known from my own work is I love working with groups because everybody brings their stuff to the table and we get to leave it all. <laughs> so it, it might not have been something you actually would have said maybe in a one-on-one session and you wouldn't even thought about it, but somebody else says it and you go, oh yeah. And all of a sudden that's part of the group and it's also part of your opportunity to change. There's no question about it that I would say in most transformational work, but especially in the work I do with my clients, being in a community of like-minded women who are on the same journey is so inspiring and you learn from each other. So I'm not the only teacher. You can really learn from someone who might be a few steps ahead of you. And you are so right. Somebody will ask a question and then someone else will say, oh my God, I feel the same way. And it's like that connection and that support. And there's nothing like it, especially in this work with the culture we live in, where it's diet, 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 right? There's diet culture in the doctor's office. There's diet culture in the supermarket. There's diet culture everywhere, right? Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your maybe your partner. And it's nice to be in community with others who get it, who can support you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can probably tell I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> But, the, you know, that's the exciting part, right? Because for people who may have been uh, stuck in their position for a long period of time, don't know where to turn next because everywhere they turn, is it's not worked out. To know that somebody has lived it, come through it, and is successful at sharing it, you know, that's who you want in your corner. And uh, if you're in a group session, you want somebody who's really passionate about their subject because you know they've dove into every aspect they could find um, oh. in order to, you know, expand it and make it as complete as possible. So, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, congratulations to you for what you've done and also for the way you've changed the way people can think about food. Because it's, it should be a celebration every day. It is. It is. It should be. It, it absolutely is, you know, and uh, I'm happy to spread the message. So mm-hmm. I appreciate that of you giving me that way, you know, time to do that. So. <laughs> I hope it landed on, uh, it, you know, if, if whoever's listening to this, you needed to hear this message. I hope it's helped you today. Mm-hmm. And so to be making sure that they go to your website have a look at the book, have a look at the programs you have available. And if there's a fit, then to be able to like push the button, reach out, <laughs> reach Absolutely. out because you're not alone. And uh, we have Absolutely. the opportunity to change. We, we can yeah. get on a quick call. We could talk about your situation, what your challenges are. And we could even, you know, I will tell you if this is a right fit for you, if this journey is is the right next step for you. It's, it's not always for people. And I've shared that, right? I've given mm-hmm. addi- initial steps first. Um, and so never hesitate to reach out to someone who is offering to help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with that, how about if we move into a movement pattern? Because I always like to finish off the podcast with if you've sat down to have your cup of tea or relaxed and now you're thinking about, I have to get going, what am I going to do? What is a movement pattern that you like to go to uh, that just gets you back moving and, and feeling like uh 
like you're ready for the next thing? Mm. For me, I do a variety of different types of movement depending on my mood in the moment and how my body is feeling. So I will always ask my body, how do you feel? What type of movement do you want to do? It's generally joyful and gentle. Um, and so oftentimes if I'm kind of hanging, sitting, and I need to kind of get myself slowly moving, it might be some type of Pilates uh, that I move into, some some exercises around that. And then it depends what else, what else <laughs> I'm in the mood for. There's no exercise prescription, meaning I do move my body every day, but it's not to burn calories and it's not to lose weight, right? It's to feel good in my body. It's this embodied movement concept. Mm -hmm. So I really do ask myself, what do, what do I feel like doing today? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you expressed it that way because I haven't had anybody else say it that way, but that's also how I think. And I kind of know when I, I go to move that my whole body is not connected into the movement that I'm going to do. So that's when, you know, you get up from the chair and, or the couch is a really bad one because you, you're sitting definitely in a hard position and you go to get up and you do those first couple hobbling pieces <laughs> to try to get the body to go. And some people will just continue along with that. And sometimes I do because I, I'm going to wander up to bed, but if I stop and think about this body is not coordinated, then what activity can I do that can bring that coordination back in? And then if I just take a moment to do that tiny little bit of movement, everything is so much different. Right, right. Um, yeah. Sometimes so it's just a stretch. Sometimes it's a stretch. It's a bend, yeah. the right, the left, arms overhead. Like it really depends what I'm feeling in the moment and what I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I was going to suggest for those people that are listening is um, moving the midsection. Because a lot of times we do get up and we walk forward or we go to the kitchen and we, we have like a forward action and it's kind of a straight movement. But not very often do we actually turn the spine so it rotates from one side to the other. And when we turn the spine, we have the opportunity for all the muscles to engage. And mm -hmm. the turn doesn't have to be very far. Um, I always think about if, if you were holding a balloon in front of you, you just turn the balloon so it's kind of over top of one knee. And then if you turn the other way, just put the balloon over top of the other knee. And that tiny little bit of back and forth um, from Tai Chi, we call it the belt channel. So around the midsection, that's where all of the circular lines line up with all the straight lines that pass through the body. So from an electrical perspective, you can fire up a lot of different systems with that little bit of turn. And in the spine, you have the opportunity to just do that tiny little bit of turning and the whole nervous system gets to light up and engage. So I would invite people to think about when they need to engage something, perhaps just think about turning the spine. And that's also easy to do if you are sitting in the living room or you've been reading a book for a little while and you haven't moved just to take a few moments and just turn mm -hmm. and then just see how everything reacts with that. Um, yeah. And then that intuitive piece, because if you've moved a couple of times, you're going to go, oh, you know, that shoulder needs a little bit more. And usually you move yourself to the next place and right. what you right. need. Yeah. Beautiful. Is there anything, Bonnie, that we missed? Anything extra? I, I think we covered a lot. I just <laughs> want to thank you for this opportunity. And I just, again, if anybody out there is just resonating with being stuck in dieting and the yo-yoing, you can get out of it and you can re get back to being an intuitive eater just like you were born. And I want mm -hmm. you, to, and you may not believe that because it may be hard to believe, but I really hold that belief for every one of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Those are great words to finish with, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Season three is devoted to the transformational process that happens when people reach out uh, into their authentic selves and they create magic. Our season has several different publications that happen through the month and we hope that those different directions help to inspire and empower you to consider living your true heart's desire with love and compassion and putting that compassion at the forefront when working with others. So thank you for joining us. This is Be Well with Michelle Greenwell and I'm wishing you well.
Thank you so much, Bonnie. You're welcome.